Okay, let's, uh, if everybody stand, we're going to do something a little bit different today. Uh, in fact, we're going to start it off with, with music and our worship time and then uh, with the, sh with the shamar, um, uh, Shema as well. So uh, let's stand and are you ready to move and get in worship? Yeah. All right. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Let's sing the Shema unto him. Shema Yisrael, Yahweh. Blessed is the name of his esteemed kingdom for all eternity. Amen. Leviticus chapter 14. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, This shall be the Torah of the leper for the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go out of the camp. And the priest shall look and see if the leprosy is healed in the leper. Then the priest shall command, and he shall take for him who is to be cleansed two live and clean birds, and cedar wood, and scarlet, and hyssop. And the priest shall command, 
and he shall slay one of the birds in an earthen vessel over running water. Let him take the live bird and the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop and dip them and the live bird in the blood of the bird that was slain over the running water. And he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed from the leprosy. And he shall pronounce him clean and shall let the live bird loose in the open field. And he who is to be cleansed shall wash his garments and shall shave off all his hair and wash himself in water and shall be clean. Then after he, ha he comes into the camp, he shall stay outside his tent seven days. And on the seventh day it shall be that he shaves off, shaves all the hair off his head and his beard and his eyebrows, even all his hair he shaves off. And he shall wash his garments and wash his body in water and shall be clean. And on the eighth day he shall take two male lambs, perfect ones, and one ewe lamb, a year old, a perfect one, and three tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering, and one log of oil. <coughs> and the priest who is cleansing shall present the man who is to be cleansed with these offerings before Yahweh at the door of the tent of appointment. And the priest shall take one male lamb and shall bring it as a guilt offering and the log of oil and wave them as a wave offering before Yahweh. And he shall slay the lamb in the place where he slays the sin offering and the ascending offering in a set-apart place for the guilt offering, like the sin offering, belongs to the priest. It is most set apart. And the priest shall take some of the blood of the guilt offering, and the priest shall put it on the tip of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed, and on the thumb of the right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot. And the priest shall take some of the log of oil and pour it in the palm of his own left hand. And the priest shall dip his right finger in the oil that is in the, his left hand and shall sprinkle some of the oil with his finger seven times before Yahweh. And the rest of the oil in his hand, the priest puts some on the tip of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed and on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot and blood of the guilt on the blood of the guilt offering and the rest of the oil that is in the priest's hand he puts in the, on the head of him who is to be cleansed and the priest shall make atonement for him before Yahweh and the priest shall make the sin offering and make atonement for him who is to be cleansed from his uncleanness. Then afterwards he slays the ascending offering. And the priest shall offer the ascending offering and the grain offering on the slaughter place. And the priest shall make atonement for him and he shall be clean. But he who is poor and is unable to afford it, then he shall take one male lamb as a guilt offering to be waived to make atonement for him, and one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering and a log of oil. And the two turtle doves, and two turtle doves, or two young pigeons, such as he is able to afford, and one shall be a sin offering, and the other an ascending offering. 
and he shall bring them to the priest on the eighth day for his cleansing to the door of the tent of appointment before Yahweh. And the priest shall take the lamb of the guilt offering and the log of oil, and the priest shall wave them as a wave offering before Yahweh. And he shall slay the lamb of the guilt offering, and the priest shall take some of the blood of the guilt offering and put it on the tip of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed, and on the thumb of the right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot. Then the priest shall pour pours some of the oil into the palm of his own left hand, and the priest shall sprinkle with his right finger some of the oil that is in his left hand seven times before Yahweh. And the priest shall put some of the oil that is in his hand on the tip of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed, and on the thumb of the right hand and on the big toe of his right foot on the place of the blood of the guilt offering. And the rest of the oil that is in the priest's hand, he puts on the head of him who is to be cleansed to make atonement for him before Yahweh. And he shall prepare one of the turtle doves or young pigeons, such as he is able to afford, and that which is he is able to afford the one as a sin offering and the other as an ascending offering with the grain offering and the priest shall make atonement for him who is to be cleansed before Yahweh. This is the Torah of one who had an infection of leprosy who is unable to afford for his cleansing. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe and to Aaron, saying, When you come into the land of Canaan, which I am giving you as a possession, and I put a plague of leprosy in a house in the land of your possession, then, you shall, then shall the one who owns the house come and inform the priest, saying, It seems to me that there is some plague in the house, and the priest shall command, and they shall empty the house before the priest goes in to look at the plague, so that the, all the, that is in the house is not made unclean. And after that, the priest goes in to look at the house, and he shall look at the plague and see, and if the plague is on the walls of the house, with sunken places, greenish or reddish, which appear to be deep in the wall, then the priest shall go out of the house to the door of the house and shut up the house seven days. And the priest shall come again on the seventh day and look and see if the plague has spread on the walls of the house. Then the priest shall command and they shall remove the stones with the plague in them and they shall throw them outside the city into an unclean place while he lets the house be scraped inside all around and the dust that they scrape off they shall pour out in an unclean place outside the city and they shall take some of take other stones and put them in the place of those stones which take other mortar and plaster the house. And if the plaster becomes black and breaks out in the house after he has removed the stones, after he has scraped the house and after it is plastered, then the priest shall come and look and see if the plague has spread in the house it is an active leprosy in the house. It is unclean. And he shall break down the house, its stones and its timber and all the plaster of the house, and he shall bring them outside the city to an unclean place. 
and he who goes into the house all the days while it is shut up becomes unclean until evening. He who lies down in the house has to wash his garments, and he who eats in the house has to wash his garments. However, if the priest indeed comes in and looks at it and sees that the plague has not spread in the house after the house was plastered, then the priest shall pronounce the house clean because the plague is healed. And, the, and to cleanse the house, he shall take two birds and cedar wood and scarlet and hyssop, and he shall slay one of the birds in an earthen vessel over running water. And he shall take the cedar wood and the hyssop and the scarlet and the live bird and dip them in the blood of the slain bird and in the running water and shall sprinkle the house seven times. He shall thus cleanse the house with the blood of the bird and the running water and the live bird with the cedar wood and with the hyssop and with the scarlet and he shall let the live bird loose outside the city in an open field and shall make atonement for the house and it shall be clean. This is the Torah of any infection of leprosy or, and eruption and for leprosy of a garment and for a house and for, the, for a swelling and for a scab and for a bright spot to teach when it is unclean and when it is clean. This is the Torah of leprosy. You may be seated. Some of this um, I talked about last week, but I, I kind of want to go a little bit deeper this week and take a look at some things. I have been so impressed with the idea that um, we're kind of doing some of the same things as Israel did. And I think that one of the th things that Israel had done <laughs> while they're going through this process is that they were very, very earthbound focused. You, you remember that um, when they came out and were delivered from Egypt, the struggle that they kept having was the idea that they wanted to go back to Egypt. Um, you know, they, they uh, kept saying, in fact, when, even before that they actually came out and before Egypt was, um, was done, you know, when the water closed in on them, uh, they were saying things like, it says that they turned and saw that Pharaoh and his army were, came, came, were coming down on them. And it says that they turned and they were, they were terrified or afraid. That word in the Hebrew is, is yare, and it means to reverence. Okay, I want this to soak in because they were reverencing Pharaoh and his army. The other idea for it is worship, okay? And Moshe was very pointed about what he told them to do. He said, stop reverencing, stop worshiping Egypt, and instead present yourself to your salvation. Okay, and he was talking about the cloud, and of course, we know that the cloud at that time, and Scripture tells us um, in the, in, that in the midst of the cloud was the angel of what? Yahweh, the angel of the Lord. Well, theologians for years and years and years have believed um, that this angel was, was the, in, the precarnate Yeshua. We see the, the Yeshua in the burning bush. We see um, all of these things taking place um, as Moses, uh, El Moshe, bumps into this particular person. I'm thinking that we're still too involved in um, earthly things. And we're still making some of the mistakes. And this, you're going to hear me talk about this again at the 11 o'clock service. Not the exact same things, but uh, 
I want to take it further in, in that. And then even in the, uh, the Midrash today, I'm hoping all of you brought your, your Hebrew books and all of that because I'm going to put you to work and we're going to trace some of this out, okay? But in this particular passage, he's talking specifically about leprosy. And we talked a little bit about that, even um, the idea of coming into the unclean and so forth. But in this particular one, uh, we're talking about leprosy. And it, and it actually calls it a plague. And the Hebrew for plague means to trip. And it also means infection and disease. Okay? When I say trip, it also uses this term, a stumbling block. Okay? And it's interesting because he says, Yahweh says, that when I put this plague on you, he says, what I'm really doing is, is creating, I'm putting before you a stumbling block so you'll pay attention of what's going on. When you see these things, you'll pay attention. Okay, so if we notice that, that this priest doesn't do anything uh, himself, but he inspects this person that has plague. He doesn't do something, some ritual for, for healing. Did you notice that? He does not do a ritual for healing. He inspects it, pronounces it, separates the person out, right? If the person becomes clean, he inspects it and brings the person back and then does, does the cleansing, goes through the cleansing part of the rituals, okay? He does not do any healing because that is Yahweh's job. You see what I mean? And this is important for us to get because we, and, and this kind of blows my mind, in the church today, we see it all over TV. I like to call it the Big Hair Channel. And you all know which I'm talking about. I'm not going to mention it, but you all know what I'm talking about, right? And everybody that has the gift of healing is promoted somehow above everybody else. And you get your own TV slot. And you've seen crazy craziness going on as they, they do certain things to uh, heal people, right? I, it, it's, it's insane. Because I'm thinking, this, is, this gift of healing is not a, it's not a person. It's, it's Yahweh's. It, it's the Holy Spirit. It's the Ruach that gives this person not the ability to do something, but dwells within this person, and it is the Ruach, the scripture tells us, 1 Corinthians 12, chapter 12, verse 7, says this, that the, these gifts are manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Man does not heal anything. The Ruach does. Man does not cleanse anything. The Ruach does. Right? So when we look at this, we tend to look at the rituals that take place and want to follow those rituals without first having looked at the spirit or the ruach of what he's doing in our lives. I may not be, as a pastor here, I may not be the best choice because I have certain gifts and I may not have that gift of healing. Do you understand? Scripture tells us that Yahweh in his infinite wisdom, has put the body together in such a way that he's given people gifts and he's put them in such a place that it benefits the whole. Each of our gifts benefit the whole. So as we, as we look at this, I wanted to begin to get this straight. Is, is there, are there any comments? You're all looking at me and going, okay, what's up with that? You know, along the same lines of the aspect of healing, it's interesting to note that, yeah, I'm on. Am I on? Good. I'm on. Is this live stream? Yes, it is. Okay. The interesting part about this is that, that when an individual believes that they were healed, they call upon the priest. The priest had to come outside the camp and to minister to see whether or not they were clean. If they were clean, then he ordered the animals to be killed, the hyssop and the, all that, and the, and the animal be let go. Then they, he could come into the camp, but he couldn't stay within his tent. 
for seven days. He had to sit outside of his tent, and on the eighth day, he could go before the temple and get clean. You fast forward to Second Kings, and where Naaman had to go into the Jordan River and dip himself seven times. Again, that's part of that cleansing, but in order for him to be healed, he had to follow the guidelines that he was told by Elisha. And it's interesting to note that a lot of the ancient writers associate this with in Proverbs chapter 6, or maybe chapter 5, of the seven abominations that displeases the Heavenly Father. So we see there's a, a commonality about the healing, about cleanliness, and about how we're supposed to live our lives, all associated with this one Torah portion. Right, and, and I'm getting there, because um, the other thing I want to bring up is that he very specifically talks about leprosy, the way you recognize leprosy is that it's deeper than the skin. It's deeper than the skin. And the reason that I bring this up is I believe that this is actually describing a spiritual problem within that person, okay? Turn with me to uh, 2 Chronicles, and we'll be looking at chapter 26, and uh, verse, verses 1 through 5. Okay, in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verses 1 through 5, it says, All the people of Judah took, took Uzra, who was 16 years old, and made him uh, king in place of his father, Amrath. Um, he, he built Elos and restored it to Judah after uh, his father died as the king rested it with his fathers. Uzra was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem, his mother's name was Jekala uh, uh, from Jerusalem. He did what was right in, in Yahweh's eye, sight as, as his father had done. He sought, he sought Yahweh throughout the lifetime of Zechariah and the teacher of the fear of, of Yahweh. Uh, during the time he, he, sought, he sought Yahweh, Elohim, and, gave him, and Elohim gave him success. Yahweh gave him success. So clearly it says that he did what was right in, in the eyes of Yahweh. This is important, okay? At that time, at this place, this period of time, he was doing, it specifically says that he was doing what was right in Yahweh's eyes, okay? Now I want to go to the, the, chapter 26, verses 16 through 21. And it says, but when he, when he became strong, he grew arrogant. Do you see that? And it led to his own destruction. He acted unfaithfully against Yahweh, his Elohim, by going into Yahweh's sanctuary to burn incense on the incense altar. altar, altar. Azura, the, the priest, along with 80 brave priests of Yahweh, went in after him. They took their, their stand against King Uzra and said, Uzra, you have no right to offer sin, incense to Yahweh. Only the, the consecrated priests, the, the descendants of Aaron, and the right, and the right to uh, offer incense. Leave the sanctuary, for you have acted unfaithfully, and you will not receive honor from, Yah, from Yahweh. Uzra, with, with a fire pan, in his hand, offer incense, was enraged. When, but when he became enraged with the priest, in the presence of the priest in, the, in, in Yahweh's temple, beside the, the altar of incense, a skin disease, and that is actually uh, translated leprosy, broke out on his forehead. Do you see that? Here we are, and what we're, we're looking at is a spiritual issue. Now, I got it to noticing, and I brought this up before. We say in this, where we're at in, in, our, in our understanding now, Shabbat Shalom. You all get to take off. 
of work and, and relax. I don't. And so I was asking, what does Shabbat Shalom really mean? And I re increasingly realized that, that my Shabbat started off really bad. It was like this huge issue physically every Shabbat. And so I, I need to pin this down. So what I did was I began to pray about it. You need to reveal this to me because I don't want this to be part of me. When I started to realize that every Shabbat, I started off anxious. Anxious about the day, anxious about what I was going to talk about, anxious about whether it would be received. I got to tell you something, whether you guys receive a message that I give or not has very little difference on the success of, of what took place that day. Because the one that needs to be pleased is Yahweh. I'm not saying I don't love you. I'm not saying I don't care about you. But what I'm saying is that whether you receive it or not, I don't have any power over that. As long as you're always pleased with what I'm talking about, and what he's given me, it's like him. It's like this king. Right? He started doing what was not right in Yahweh's eyes. He, he stopped being a king and decided, oh, I'm going to be the priest. I'm going to be the high priest. I'm going to do what I want to. After all, I'm powerful. You know, when we look at, well, it's not up there now, but when we look at this passage, um, he, it's, it says that he's to present a, a guilt offering, and that guilt offering can also be translated sin offering. Now, let me ask you this. If we needed a sin offering for something that just came on us, why would we need a sin offering? Because we were a victim rather than our sin. Come on. Yeah, just as, as it read, when it came to the household, the house even, it's a plague from Yahweh. Just in the Torah portion, it says that, that plague is from Yahweh. It ain't from Hasatan. And, and him breaking out in the head, it was from Yahweh to wake us up. It's a physical manifestation of what is in our house. And, and when it comes to the house and they scrape the wall, that means it's a plague maybe not necessarily in that man, but in his household, the authority that he has over his household. He has to clean up something in that house. And even if it inevitably means tearing down the whole house and starting over. And, well, and, and, you're, and you're right. It's all to lead us to Yeshua. They're just making atonement to lead to Yeshua. It ain't. We're healing anybody. Right. It's just Yeshua. The, the, the plague comes from Yahweh. Yahweh is the healer of the plague. And we... Just look to Yeshua, and that the whole portion is about looking to Yeshua for our healing spiritually. Hallelujah. Turn with me to Numbers chapter 12, verses 1 through 16. It says, Miriam and Aaron criticized Mo Moshe because of the Cushonite woman he married, for he, he, had, he had married a Cushonite woman, they, they said, does Yahweh speak only through Moses? Does he not also speak through us? And, and Yahweh heard it. Moses was a very humble man, 
more so than any man on the face of the earth. Suddenly, Yahweh said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, you three come out to the tent of meeting. So that the three of them went out, then the, woman, the Yahweh uh, descended in a, in a pillar of cloud, stood at the entrance of the tent, and summoned Aaron and Miriam. When the two of them came forward, he said, listen to what I say. If there is a prophet among you from Yahweh, I will make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. Not so that my, my servant, not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my household. I speak with him directly, openly, and not in riddles. He sees the form of Yahweh. So why were you why were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? The, then Yahweh's anger burned against them, and he left. As the cloud moved away from the tent, Miriam's skin suddenly became diseased, and that is leprosy, as white as snow. When Aaron turned toward her, he saw that, that she was diseased and said to, to Moses, My master, please don't hold against us this sin that we so foolishly committed. Please don't let her be like a dead baby whose flesh has half eaten away when he comes out of, out of his mother's womb. Then, then Moses said to, to Yahweh, Elohim, please heal her. Then Yahweh answered Moses, if, if her father had merely spit it in her face, wouldn't she remain in, in disgrace for seven days? Let her be, be confined against the, uh, outside the camp for seven days. After, um, after that, she may be brought in, back in. So Miriam was confined outside the camp for seven days, and the people did not move on until Miriam was brought back in. There it is again. There's a spiritual issue here. Now, it may just be a coincidence. I, I understand that. But I don't think so. I think that as, as we progress in this whole thing, I think that we'll see that it is, it's really a spiritual issue. In fact, you know what? If we go to Hebrews chapter 8, does it not say that he gave Moses a shadow picture of the things that were in the heavens. The spiritual affects us in the physical. You know, I woke up today feeling good. No anxiousness. It's all good. I was looking forward, and still am, of talking to you about this because you know what I know it works you know what I did I got before my wife and I said you know what my problem is anxiety it's a spirit of anxiety I said so let's get it out of here and we pray it was gone You see, they're finding, even medical science is finding out that what we dwell on affects us physically. When, when, when they were delivered out of Egypt, what were they delivered from? What, was that, what is that whole thing about? See, here's what we have in the, in the church today. Is that salvation means that I'm purified and now I'm going to heaven. But you know the, the word salvation actually means deliverance? So that means that I must be delivered from something. Right? And according to what he says, according to what was said in when they were delivered, they were delivered from the plagues of Egypt. So that tells me something about these plagues. 
That tells me that these plagues have to do with disease and that de disease has to do with the demonic. What's going on around us? What are, we go what are we doing today? He's busy delivering us out of Babylon. And if we continue to hang on to Babylon, we are hanging on to the plagues that he's trying to, to deliver us from. And, you get this? And if we're stressing and worrying about things, we are holding on to Babylon. Because that don't exist in Yahweh's kingdom. Now we need to understand that, that the other thing that happens when we're given into the demonic is that we're also cut off from our people. We're removed outside the camp. Let, let's think about this. If we're giving in to, and I'll just use myself as an example, the spirit of anxiety, then am I not removing myself from the camp, from my people? Because I'm so concerned about what you guys might think. But if, if I don't give in to the spirit of anxiety, guess what? The, my only concern is what Yahweh thinks. And what he's given me to say. Now, did you notice that Moshe and Aaron turned around and began to pray for Miriam? Now, it makes you wonder, who stirred up who in this whole aspect of of this going against Moshe. Because you know Aaron didn't get diseased. Why was that? Because Aaron wasn't taking care of his household. He let his wife lead him. The leprosy in the house. Take care of your household. You see what I mean? What does that mean? That means as a spiritual leader in the household, I need to lead my family or I need to at least create a, an environment in my household that my, my family would be drawn to Yahweh. You know, armed with this stuff, with, armed with this stuff and armed with the reality of what this stuff is about, we have the opportunity now to be delivered if we take action. Last week in the 11 o'clock service, I talked about where the kingdom was. And I'm going to talk about a little more about that and go a little bit deeper. And it says the kingdom is within you, inside of you. Yeshua said that. He, says, he said, don't look for a physical place, something observable here. He says, because the kingdom is within you. Let me ask you this. How can we be worshiping Yahweh and worshiping another spirit as well? Whoa. Right? Right? That's a set, that sets a problem with us spiritually. Do you remember, do you remember that scripture tells you that um, if you are offering a gift at the altar and you, while you're there offering the gift, you remember that someone has something against you? Remember what it says? It says to leave the gift there and go settle the issue. You know why? Because, because, because of those issues, it's a spiritual issue. Because of those issues, you're, you're not clean to make an offering to Yahweh until you go take care of it. I have a question. So when we go and do our part, and they are still unwilling to give us forgiveness or a way to reconcile, then what do we do? 
You come back, okay, because you've done what you, you need to do, okay? Their, your cleanliness is not dependent upon them receiving uh, the forgiveness or, the, or your, your uh, uh, repentance, I mean. Yeah. Your cleanliness is not dependent upon them. Okay? <laughs> Having said that, I just had a thought, and I want you to remember this. If you're receiving what they said, then it's still, you got a problem. Because if, if you're, and, and I'm just saying, if you are, because we can believe a lie as well, and that will still get us in the same place. Okay, because we're not viewing ourselves the way Yahweh views us. You see what I mean? This is all about a spiritual eyesight. Where we look, what we really know and understand is happening. If I believe that you're my enemy, then we're in trouble. Because scripture says, you're not my enemy. Flesh and blood is not my enemy. It says it in Ephesians. It's the, the demonic that's my enemy. Why do you think we have so many splits? Because we're believing that we're each other's enemy. Right? And so therefore there's not, there's not God, there's not unity within the body. We're divided all over the place because we're still believing, we're still looking with our fleshly eyes, and we're still believing that our real enemy is you or me. Right? Why do you think it's so hard to forgive people? See, if we really understood what was going on, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be hard to forgive people. Because we'd understand that it wasn't really the people that had the problem. Oh, yeah. They were being used by the demonic. That's the real problem. Remember Job? It's, it's interesting because in Job, well, maybe I should turn there. Let's go to Job. Let me find it. I'm looking for it here real quick. Okay. Let's look at uh, chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And we're going to go to uh, chapter 9, or verse 9, I mean. It says, One day the sons of, of, of Elohim came again to present themselves before Yahweh. And, and Satan also came with them to present himself before Yahweh. Then Yahweh uh, asked Satan, Where have you come from? From roaming through the earth, Satan answered him, and walking around on it. Then Yahweh said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? No one else on earth is like him, a man of, of perfect integrity who fears, who fears Elohim and turns away from evil. He still retains the, his integrity, even though you, you incited me against him to destroy him without just cause. Skin for skin, Satan, Satan answered to, the, to Yahweh, a man will give up everything he, he owns uh, to exchange for his life. But stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. Very, 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 very well, uh, Yahweh said, told Satan. 
he is in your power, only spare, of his, spare his life. So Satan left Yahweh's presence and, and, and infected, there's that word, okay, there's that word, and in, infected Job with terrible boils from the sole of his feet to the top of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery to scrape himself, and while he sat among the ashes, his wife told, said to him, do you still um, retain your integrity? Curse Yahweh and die. The very words came out of Job's wife that, that Hasatan had spoke to Yahweh. Who do you think that might have been? What if Job decided that his wife was the enemy because of what she said? Come on. Think about this. Why do we get divorces? Because we're believing lies about another person. Right? And they've been led into lies as well. And so then the husband and wife becomes enemies. Rather than looking at the demonic forces that are their real enemies. You're all quiet. Bring the coffee. We need to get these guys pumped up. This is important stuff. This is about your life. Don't you agree? This is how you and I walk. And then the question comes in, of course, is are we going to walk according to the spirit or the flesh? Do you see what Paul's talking about there? When we look at, when we look at the fruit of the spirit, he says, tells us to walk by the spirit and not by the flesh. He, he's actually saying this. He's actually saying, open your spiritual eyes and walk according to the spirit, not according to the flesh. Pra praise Yah. Yeah, in, in the examples, even the leprosy, or like the example of Job, it was when we get hit with these things. You gave the example that you were getting ill on Shabbat, you know, because of anxiety. Well, that was just Yahweh letting you know that. And actually, we need to glorify him even when he hits us with leprosy. And in the case of Job, what a privilege it is. You know, Satan's walked around bragging how he can tear down any man. And what a privilege it is for Yahweh to say, what about my servant Job? You can't take him down. I want him to say the same thing about me. But there's a test that comes with that. I mean, there's... A test that comes up, but what a privilege. Hallelujah. I'm sitting here listening to all of this, and I'm um, thinking um, you are saying, just make sure that I'm getting it right, that um, it's not against flesh and blood, and I understand that. Um, but also, and then like you said, we walk in the flesh or in the spirit. And when we walk in the flesh, then we're walking in our will. Because mm -hmm. otherwise, we go back to the old Pentecost talking about the devil made me do it. And we are our own worst enemy. And I go back to when you asked the question about um, the sacrifices. So if we're, sac you know, if we're saying today, what sacrifices do we have? And um, I felt like the Lord laid on my heart that it's dying daily and it's ourselves that we sacrifice unto the Lord so that we make the right choices, so that we can understand exactly what you taught last week, that the kingdom is in us. And that's what has to come out um, if we're part of the kingdom. 
or otherwise we end up like uh, Yeshua's parables about the sheep and the goats and also Lord Lord when didn't I do this those are the applications that end up coming if we don't sacrifice ourselves to him right when like you said recognizing that you had a spirit of anxiety and the Lord delivered me from something too this week and it was like hallelujah because it was so um, it was joyful that I didn't have these feelings anymore you know 65 years of them and it was healed and I'm just going wow so when we understand the kingdoms in us and that it was more about me pleasing Yahweh than it was receiving something from other people and, and that's what uh, Paul says in Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 to be able to present ourselves as a living sacrifice it's what Moses told Israel present yourself to your your deliverer your salvation um, and, and Paul talks about it again here in, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse, starting at verse uh, 15. It says, this is why, since I heard about your faith in, in uh, the Master Yeshua and your love for all the saints, I never stopped giving thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that, that, that the Elohim of our Master Yeshua Messiah, the glorious Father, would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the perception of your mind may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the gracious, uh, gracious riches of his inheritance amongst, inheritance amongst the saints and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power to us who believe uh, he, according to the working of his vast strength. Now, if you notice in, in verse 19, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his vast strength? He goes on in verse 20, he says, he demonstrated this power, and he's talking about the power that he just talked about in verse 19. He demonstrated this power in Messiah by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every living, every title given, not only in this age, but in the age to come. And, and so I want to jump over from there. Oh, it, wait a minute, and I do want to finish that. And he put everything under his feet and appointed him as head over everything for the congregation, which is his body, the fullness of the one who uh, fills all things in every way. And, and then he goes on in chapter 2, starting at verse 1, it says, And you, you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler who exercises authority over the lower heavens, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the, the inclinations of the flesh, and the thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath, like the others were also. But Yahweh, who is, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, makes us alive with Messiah, even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace, together with Messiah Yeshua. He also raised us up and seated us in the heavens, with him. Now I'm going to tell you something. It's harder to be seated up in the heavens with him when we're busy serving the God of this world. It's hard to see the spiritual, into the spiritual realm when we're serving the gods of this world. Now, I'm going to tell you, I haven't got this whole thing down. Okay? I want to, but I haven't got it all down. All I'm doing is sharing with you what Yahweh shared with me this week. When I get it down, and I tell you that I get it down, run. Okay? <laughs> Is there any more comments before we close? The, um, 
the torah portion here really makes me think of what we need to do in support of one another you know there was a there was a community element that's going on it's not maybe explicitly talked about but there's a community element going on in this torah portion and i think for us when we find that it, whether ourselves maybe we have some success or maybe we have a failure in my minds their mind if they're both the opportunity to continue following him because as you took us into chronicles um uh use yahoo he he got sidetracked by pride so he he took a wrong approach he obviously had success that he could take pride in and others fall through failure both of them are a, a test of whether we're going to continue to serve Yahweh. So I think a community question, when we can see somebody is going through something negative or somebody has achieved success, is how can I help and support you continue to focus on Yahweh and pleasing Him and letting love be your greatest aim in what you're going through right now? Yeah, don't come to Him either. <laughs> don't come to Him either saying, you know what, Yahweh did that and you're still a dirtbag. Okay, we're supposed to build, build each other up, okay? Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for the time that you give us, and I thank you for your word. And I thank you for your Ruach that, um, that leads us into truth. Father, as we, as we prepare for the next service, I just ask that you just be here, just continue to, to teach us and, and continue to, to heal us um, in our, our, our vision if you will, for spiritual things. And I just praise you and thank you. In the name of Yeshua, amen. You are free to fellowship. <laughs>